Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this week's studies. We're going to continue our study on Daniel chapter 11. And not sure where we're going to go as we uh, try to move ahead and how this is going to unfold, but uh, we'll just um, continue studying and see where the Lord leads. So before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Uh, dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for all that you do in our lives. Um, we're thankful for the people around us and those that love us and care for us and those that we can love. And we are thankful, Lord, for the light uh, that you give us that brings us comfort and peace and also reveals to us our need of you. Uh, help us to see our sins and to trust in your righteousness and your work in our lives. We pray, Lord, that as we continue to look at Daniel chapter 11, that your Holy Spirit can direct us. Um, we know we need light for our feet, for uh, the decisions that we make each day. And we know, Lord, you are preparing us to, to minister to those around us and that you have a work planned in this earth and that you're working on many people's hearts and showing many people light that we have never seen. And so we just ask, Lord, that um, we can trust in your leading and guidance and trust in your plan for our lives and uh, for what's happening in the world around us. So we give our hearts to you and we ask for your presence here through thy spirit. And we pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again. So um, we were dealing with some of these chronological uh, structures in, um, in our lives. And uh, we had looked at, um, um, you know, in those times, right? So we had looked at that. And, and that gave us a date. What date did it give us? The 1992 plus the 6256. Anybody remember? Uh, that was either, there was two dates mentioned. The 8th of April and the 10th of April, 2024. Okay, yeah. And also, so we had uh, the count of... Um, uh, bringing us also to October 28th, uh, 2018, right? So the way that we had done this, um, and I know I have the chart here somewhere. So, so we had this interesting, uh, structure. So I'm going to share this that was in those times and in those times, right? So we took the word times, uh, 6256 and we counted it from 911. And it gave us October 28th, 2018. So I shared the video link and I put the video on my YouTube page of Jeff uh, presenting a summary um, of what had happened in regard to uh, November 9th and the 391 and a half. So there's going to be um, uh, the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday after the camp meeting in October of 2018. They're going to do three presentations. Jeff is going to do three presentations on the 391 and a half. I, I think I even had um, uh, something to do with one of those presentations. And I went over some of it in part of the presentation, if I remember correctly. So after the camp meeting, I, I went to Edmonton. I was there on the 22nd for a court date dealing with civil matters. And then I, I came back, uh, I know, on the 23rd at night. So I would have been there the 24th in the morning for... And I, and I know that uh, Heidi had said that they had been talking about me in a quite a negative way um, on that Tuesday morning study on the 391.5. Now, Jeff is going to talk in that video, uh, so I recommend that people watch it. Um, but he's going to talk about me a little bit, I mean, and, and some of the opposition that was happening. Obviously, at that time, he's still, you know, accepting Parminder and... Uh, and, and so forth. And there's there's some other things that he's going to address. Something about the uh, the names of the tribes of of Israel. He's going to mention something about that. And also that uh, Bronwyn had put together a paper um, dealing with October 13th, Ellen White's uh, review and hair law articles that are dated on October 13th. And so looking back at October 13th as being the midnight cry. So those things are in that video. Um, 
So this October 28th, 2018 is this summary. So it's a Sunday morning study that Jeff's going to do. Uh, so it's basically a week after the camp meeting ended. And, um, and then from there, we can count uh, 192 days. And that brings us to April 10th, the first day of the first month. It's an inclusive count, by the way. Or if we take the 1990, which is basically what that word is, just another form of that word. Um, and that would bring us to April 8th. And there is that eclipse that's coming up on April 8th. Now, <clears throat> there is a Civil War movie uh, that's coming out on uh, April 26, 2024. So if, if April 10th is the first day of the first month, April 26th is the 17th day of the first the first month. So it's the 26th day of the fourth month on our calendar, but it's going to be Nissan 17, right? Okay. You add 17 to 1, you get 17. Now, what would be the significance of the 17th day of the first month as a symbol? The Civil War movie that's following it. I know it's not really related to this, but it is. Because we've been studying the Civil Wars, right? Correct. Okay. So, and, yeah. Seventeenth day of the first month. Isn't that third day after the resurrection? It's one day after the resurrection. One day after the resurrection. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So it's the fourth day after the crucifixion. Yeah. Three full days later. Now. The significance is we already understand 117 is representing July 18th, 2020. Just like we have 1117 represents July 18th, right? Okay. 187th prime number. And then we had 11,117. And that represented what, Stephen? How did that one work? We're, I was trying to find that chart with that. Well, that was the, uh, the 1300. Um, 47th prime number. Oh, okay. So the 1347th prime number is 11,100 and, okay, that makes sense now. Okay. But, but all of those, so whether we have, you know, four ones or three ones or two ones, it connects to July 18th as a symbol, right? And, and it also connects to, in that case, to the 1533. So we have that symbol as well. So we have a Civil War movie coming up, um, put out by a film company owned by the Obamas. And it's going to be about the Civil War that's coming, right? So it's, it's obviously a propaganda film. Okay. Now, um, the other thing that was interesting when we looked at this structure, we found that there is a ratio that, that, that we can have that is pi. Now, it's really hard to get any Definitely with whole numbers to, to produce pi exactly to, you know, the infinity number of digits is, is very difficult just with, with any sort of natural ratio. So to get something so closely approximating pi, that is, we're going to take the 6256 and divide it by, and we could do it by 1992 or 1990 or 1991, you're still going to get 3.14 as the first part of that number, right? But I, I just chose here in the calculation there to divide it by uh, 1991, right? And that's going to give me this number, 3.14213962832, right? So you can see it's it's definitely slightly more than pi, if I take 6256 and divide it by 1990, I'm going to get 34143718. And so 3.141592, right, that's going to be pi. So they're going to be slightly more than pi. If I took uh, 6256 and then divided it by 1989, I'm going to get 3.14. Five two. So as I use a lower number, I'm going to keep getting a higher number of pi. And if I say six two five six two five six divided by one nine two, 
I'm going to get uh, 3.14056. So I'm going to have a, a smaller number. So it's going to be less than pi. So however we want to look at it, we can see that this relationship between the word times, the Hebrew number, and the word those, and in those, right, that it's this relationship of pi. And that's not very likely. And we know that this then relates, pi relates to the circle, it relates to time, it relates to the sky, it relates to chronology. And of course, the word times itself, six times two times five times six gives us 360, but also just the meaning of the word times relates to time. Uh, and it's this word et. Now, of course, it, the form that it's in here is va ba etim, that is, and in times, right? The ot at the end is plural for time, so it's feminine. So to me, this is very significant. And then we looked at the word many. So that was the last thing we looked at because I was, we're doing this very tedious analysis of this verse. Uh, but the word many, 7227, if you go from April 5th, 2030, and you count that many days backwards, you'll come to June 22nd, 2010. Now, June 22nd, 2010, remember, it's going to be in 2011. On June 22nd, that Jeff is going to receive the $165,000 to begin the School of the Prophets, right? And then on June 22nd, 2014, they're going to have the first camp meeting in Arkansas after they have begun the School of the Prophets. It's not going to be at the School of the Prophets because they don't have much buildings there at the time. They have it at Lambert Church. And and then the, uh, three years later, in uh, 2017, June 22nd is going to be the center of this 777 chiasm. And then we have June 22nd, three years after that, in 2020. So in 2020, you have this uh, June 22nd. And um, the significant there, of course, is, is that's when the July 18, 2020 prediction goes international. Right? It's going to be published in the Tennessean on the 21st of June but it's not going to be till the next day that it becomes international news. It becomes, it, you know, it kind of starts on June 21st a little bit, but it's, it's known the next day. So we have this June 22nd. So we have this word many. Now, uh, the word many, it's translated uh, uh, in lots of different ways. It's, it's the word rab, it, and it's a very common word. It's 469 times in the Old Testament. And it means much, many, great, many, much, abounding, more, numerous than, abundant, enough, great, strong, greater than, much, exceedingly. Also can refer to a captain or a chief. So rab, rab, right? But I believe it's related to the word rabbi, if I remember correctly, later on in Hebrew. Rabab means properly to cast together, increase in number, and to multiply by thousands, so increase uh, be many more. So, so that's the word that it is related to it. Uh, you know, that it comes from seven, two, three, one. So, but it just means a lot, right? So, so it's also a, a number that relates to measuring or quantity of something. So, so the, you know, we, so we've been in an, analyzing these words. There's, there's lots of, um, Hebrew numbers here. We haven't placed all of them as periods of time, but, you know, we probably could and find somewhere where they fit. But there's enough here in this verse to connect it to our time, right? And, and the idea here is that the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision. We know that this is Rome. So the question is, if we're looking at, at, the, at, the, at this time of these civil wars, um, we know that this is bringing us to Rome rising up and to the Sunday law, right? So we looked at this, these verses and we can say, well, what we have here is a parallel to Daniel 11 verse 40 to 45. So in verse 15, so the king of the north shall come, cast up a mount, take the most fenced cities and the arms of the south shall not withstand. That's going to be 1989, correct? That's going to be Daniel 11, verse 40b. Is that how we understand it, the parallel? Yeah, first hand. 
What about verse 10? Is that not uh, verse 40b? So what we what we did is we took verse 15, Daniel 11, verse 15. So we're not we're just looking at we have all these civil wars going, right? And the robbers of thy people exalt themselves. So we have paralleled that to pre-1989 in, in the past. That's how Jeff has looked at this. The kid, the Rome comes early. They exalt themselves. They arise to establish the vision. They do that in in the time of Christ because Rome is going to crucify Christ. But they first show up in connection with um, you know this treaty. So so we're saying that this is what's happening here, and so we we parallel this to the time prior to 1989. But then you have 1989. The king of the north comes up against the king of the south and defeats them. Now, this is the battle of Paneum that it's talking about. Right? If, if we look at Daniel chapter 11 historically, it's going to be dealing with that battle. And then we look at verse 16. But he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. So the standing in the glorious land, that's in Daniel 11, this, this whole section of 40 to 45. Right? So in 41, though, he shall enter into the glorious land, and many shall be overthrown. Right. So we can parallel those two verses. Is, is that how we do it? Is that correct? So verse 14 is sort of hearkening back. Before 1989, it's like a you're making an application that's going before them. It's like a okay. parenthesis maybe or something. Yeah, well, th- this is the way that Jeff understood it. That verse 14 is that the you know long before we had Paneum and Raphia, he he paralleled the robbers of thy people. Rome shall exalt itself to establish the vision. That this comes earlier. Before the Sunday law, because Rome is going to be there at the Sunday law, but they first have to exalt themselves to establish the vision. And they did that in our history in the 1980s, right? The papacy comes and makes this league with Reagan. Yeah. So anyway, let's just, let's just deal with it th- that way. So they have this league with Reagan. Now Rome is exalting itself. It's going to have a league later with the Jews, but it comes in early, right? So it comes in early. It has to, be there before it's really fulfilling its role, right? So this is what happens in this history. Rome comes, and what they're doing is they're going to be uh, on the side of the king of the south to make sure that the king of the north doesn't become too powerful. So they're making sure that Egypt isn't destroyed at this point. But later on, Rome is going to conquer, of course, the king of the north and the king of the south, right? Rome is going to become this world empire. But here at this point, that's not what it's doing. But it does exalt itself to establish the vision. We know Swearingen tries to put this as a Tychus Epiphanes, uh, but we are very clear that this is actually Rome. So then when the king of the north shall come and cast up the mount, take the most fenced cities, um, you know, we're relating this to the battle of Paneum, right? This is going to be uh, Paneum and all this. And then when it says, he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, none shall stand before him. And he shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. This is referring to Rome, historically. Because we move from Greece to Rome in this story, in, in the historical application. Is that how we do it? Am I getting it wrong? Right. According to your eyes, Smith. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, right. So so here we're in this history now of Rome. So so we recognize that there's these civil wars in Greece that parallel our history. The kings of Persia parallel our history. But when we get to the end of this history here of Greece and Rome now exalts itself to establish the vision, it's illustrating what we see in Daniel 11, verse 41. He shall stand in the glorious land. I mean, that's Daniel 11, verse 41, right? So that means if we're going to make a parallel of this now, just like we did with with each of these histories, with the kings of Persia, we started in 1989. 
with Greece, with Alexander, we're going to have the fall of his kingdom. That's going to be 1989. So now at the end of the Civil War, we have Greece. But Rome comes in and it's going to be 1989. Right. So we, we come again with Rome to begin at 1989 at the time of the end. So each of these nations is illustrating our history from the time of the end to the Sunday law. But here, it's you're going to be at the time of the end, 1989. Uh, but you're also going to be connected to, to, to the Sunday law. But it's just giving you this in a nutshell at the beginning. But then we have to go back once we start getting through the history of Rome. It's going to give us more detail about that history from 1989 to the Sunday law. Right. So that's the way I understand we're doing it. And I just want to see if other people are on the same page. Well, with what we began talking this last week. Mm -hmm. And as I was pointing out from the 1769 King James, we know that there there is at least a notation. On the robbers of thy people to being the children of the robbers of thy people. Mm-hmm. The way that the way that you're approaching this is very much in line with Josiah Litch. It's very much in line with what many of the of the pioneers would have held. Mm-hmm. Now, in Litch's prophetic exhibitions number two, pages twenty one and twenty and twenty one, he quotes from Newton's dissertations. And that's uh, uh, Thomas Newton. He's Bishop Newton. Right. Right. Not Isaac Newton. No, I I wasn't saying that. He's a relative, relative, but but yeah. So I have have the book. Well, I had it. My nephew has it now. I had, like, not an original copy, but, you know, one from, like, the 1700s or 1600s or something like that. I had a really old copy of it. Anyway, but in in Lich's prophetic expositions, making notations that Antiochus was not the only one who rose up against the young Ptolemy, others also were confederated with him. Now, he goes through a number of parties that were looking to take away the dominion of Ptolemy IV. So do we have a figurative representation of not only external but internal parties that are looking to take this where Rome, or at least, as I keep seeing it, the children of Rome, the spirit of Rome, start stepping in. Definitely Rome is is here, right, in this whole history. Agreed. You know, so, I mean, that's where Rome exalts itself to establish the vision, right? And and I'm just looking here, as you can see, at um, uh, Lich's book here, where he's quoting Bishop Newton. Right. So the breakers of thy people were Romans who, at the time here spoken of, interposed in behalf of the infant king of Egypt to protect him from the ruin proposed by Antiochus and Philip as this was one of the first important inferences, interferences of the Romans with the affairs of Syria and Egypt, and formed, so to speak, the stepping stone to their future conquests and dominion. It will be proper to give an account Roland has furnished of it, right? So they're going to go through that a little bit more. But so so we've understood that history. So we're not going to go along with swearing in in his interpretation of this. So when we, and and we're going to go back to our, our document that we've been working on where we're, you know, putting in the present truth application. So we've just been spending a lot of time studying this to make sure that we understand it correctly. We've been gleaning the field and um, recognizing that there's lots that we had not understood thoroughly. And and that definitely affected our ability to, to interpret this. Right. So we didn't like guessing. I don't like guessing. Yeah, uh, Swearingen, I think he's just using Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary version, so he's just going, they're saying what I've heard. 
Yeah. So, and, and we know what I think about the Seventh Day Adventist Bible commentary. <laughs> not that my opinion matters, but, um, it definitely is not, uh, uh, Adventism in its approach. So when we go back, so, you know, we know that we're dealing with, um, like in verse 14, I think this is the document we were working on. It doesn't look like we, we filled this all in. I thought we had one with it more filled in. Yeah, so this is, so here we had stopped at verse 10. But if I go to this other one, there we go, we're up to verse 16. So if we go back and look at this document that we had. So we looked at those times, so I'm going to have to put some footnotes about and in those times, I'm going to have to add some of these charts and stuff to this because we did a lot of work that we haven't added to here. So I don't know exactly how. So Rome established it, the robbers of thy people, I wrote. Now, I know, Dwight, you keep putting emphasis upon the children of the robbers of thy people, but I don't understand why. Okay. Because to me, it sounds like you're saying that these are descendants of the robbers of thy people exalt themselves but that's not the sense i get from the verse no i'm not i'm not pushing the descendants but i'm also looking is this possibly giving us reference to those that will stand up in the spirit of rome yeah see i don't because we have to apply the text first historically so when it says the children of the robbers of the people this is just an expression to show that this is a group of people so even though you can translate the word as children, it's not necessarily what it means here. So it, it, it it's kind of necessary in the Hebrew to have, you can't just say the robbers of thy people, because that could just be a, a, a few individuals, right? Correct. Here it means this group of people. So that's why it's it's Rome. And it's the beginning of Rome, which I think is the main idea. It's, you know, it's... It's, Historically, I agree. This is the beginning of Rome. Yeah. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't take that and then say, well, because we have the word children there, it's, it's, you know, that it's going to follow that later on there's going to be people in that spirit of Rome. Because this is about Rome. And, and Rome, and when we're applying it historically, we're always applying it to Rome. And when we're applying it in an application, we're always applying it to Rome. Right. So in the application here, it has to be the papacy in our time. And if you want to say, well, you know, because it said the children of the robbers of thy people. And it, it, I just don't understand the significance of why you keep bringing it up. That's all. Maybe there's something I'm missing. Well, we're agreeing. And we're, we're very much in agreement yeah. that historically. The robbers of thy people represent Rome. Mm-hmm. My question remains, is the historical application going to apply to us at this time? Right. And so we don't need the word children there to have it apply to us at this time. Because, see, that word, it also just means a member of a group. Correct. Right. I can agree with that. It also can be translated people of a nation and a member of a guild or order or class. So just because it's, it can be translated as a son, that really it's children would not be a good translation because it, it refers to a son generally or a child, but a male child or a grandson, right? Now it was untranslated by the translators. They don't, they don't put it there. They just say also the robbers, right? And so, so they're including it in there. That is, when they put the word robbers, which is like breakers, um, you know, people that are, are crushing you, they exalt themselves. So this group of people, this, they're members of this group are going to exalt themselves to establish the vision. And, and the way that I would look at it is that this has to do with the daily. So this is, you know, this is talking about paganism, right? This is, the persecutory power of paganism. So it, it's connected to that, to that group of persecutors. But we don't need that word there to apply it to our time, right? It's not like, you understand what I'm saying? I know we agree on that. It's just, I don't know if it's why you bring it up. 
Like it doesn't change the interpretation of how we're applying this. At least to me, it doesn't. Okay. I, yes, I'm going to look at this. I'm, I'm going to ask questions. I don't have the understanding of the Hebrew grammar that you do. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I look at what I'm seeing in the 1769 King James. Yeah. Because in the current editions, they're not going to be looking at this as the robbers of thy people in the way that we're delving into it. Well, yeah, in the modern King James, they just don't have the basically all these footnotes because these are just footnotes, marginal notes uh, that were put in when they did the translation. And those have been removed from most King James Bibles. There are King James Bibles. You can have those notes in them. Right. And, and, and they're called the Treasury of Scripture Knowledge on the e-sword, though there's a few times that uh, for some reason – the in putting together ESOR, they made some typos or mistakes where they actually just left out some references. I don't think it was intentional. Uh, it just, just happened that, you know, however they put the program together, some things got lost. So I'm not sure what the computer problem, it's a type of computer typo where something doesn't get attached to, to a verse that should be. But anyway, so I, I, I just, it, I just don't know why it's relevant. That's all I'm saying, because I don't think it is. That it's there, we, we need to know it, and we know it, but it doesn't change the interpretation of the verse. It doesn't change how we apply it to our time as well. Or are or, or you saying that it does affect how we apply it to our time? Well, I'm wondering if it does affect and how we apply it to our time. Okay. So well, we looked at it, we looked at it, and it didn't affect it. At this, at this point, I just, as, as we're going through this again on Monday, or excuse me, on, on Sunday, I'm just bringing it back up because we had addressed it. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we had addressed it and, and the conclusion we came to is it, it just makes that this is a group, you know, it's not a bunch of individuals that, you know, just, come and rob that people. This is a group or a nation, right? Because it can be translated as, as people of a nation. So this is Rome. So Rome exalts itself to establish the vision, but they shall fall. And we dealt with the falling of this as uh, the ultimate end, but but it, it falls at different times. It's going to fall. Pagan Rome is going to fall. And so is papal Rome, right? Okay. Right. So, so we had, uh, that fall, uh, symbolizing that. So when we look at this, what we have here for verse 14, we say in those times during the fifth Syrian war, there shall many, uh, Philip the fifth king of Macedon and Antiochus the third, which are going to represent uh, in this context, the USA. Shall stay, stand up, make propaganda against the king of the south, uh, Ptolemy the fourth, Philip Hatter, Biden, right? So I don't know if that makes sense, right? So we, we might have to sort of rethink how we're looking at this. And, and one of the things is the things that are in black, that's, that's Swearingen's, uh, for the most part, he put some of those there. Some of them we changed from what he had. But this, this idea of standing up, we're saying is making war. And, and in this case, uh, it's propaganda. Now, when we say that Philip V, King of Macedon, and Antiochus III is the USA, well, they're, they're, if they're making war against the King of the South, which is Biden, well, Biden is the USA. So the, the question is, how do we address that? But anyway, we'll come back. And then also the robbers of thy people, that's Rome, the papacy, shall exalt themselves, come into history, join in the threefold union at the Sunday law to establish the vision. Well, we're going to have to change some of this because because we're not taking that they come in to join at the threefold union at the Sunday law in this time. If we're going to make a pra- uh, an application to our time, so you can see how all of this work that we did, uh, I think, was necessary to come back and look at these verses again, right? So we spent a lot of time, a big diversion, but I think we understand the verse much better. So so we're going to change that. 
and uh, to establish the vision, the Chazon, from 723 B.C. to 1798. That's what the Chazon is, to represent the two desolating powers. So the image of the beast is formed, causing the joining of the two sticks. So that's what we say to establish the vision. But again, we would have to say that that's not quite right. And then they shall fall. And so we have the fall of pagan Rome and papal Rome. And that's going to parallel the close of probation in the seven last plagues. Right. So that's true. But then we have this. So the king of the north, Antiochus III, the republicanism of the U.S. shall come. So this is circa 200 B.C. And we're placing this. I put it as April 5th, 2030. We're not predicting a date there. We just, that date shows up as part of this structure and cast up a mount. That is, this is the siege, which we're going to say is the persecution. Take the most fenced cities of Judea, and that is in Sidon, um, the apostate Protestant churches and the arms of the South, the Egyptian army under Ptolemy V, the radical left shall not withstand stand up, lose the battle of Paneum, lose ideological battle. And his chosen people, neither his chosen people, which we say the choicest people, the elite, we put in question marks, neither shall there be any strength to, to withstand, stand up. Now, the elite, of course, would be like the World Economic Forum and so forth. They're going to lose in that, that battle, this elite. That's the battle of the elites. And then we have that stand up. We didn't put anything there. But he, pagan Rome, the papacy that cometh against him, Seleucid Syria, the USA, shall do according to his own will. And we got 191 BC, which we attach to midnight. It's the center of the 62 weeks. And uh, it's connected to midnight because the center is uh, 217 years. If you take the 343 and divide it by two, you get 217. So you get the symbol of midnight. And none shall stand before him, will subjugate Syria and become the next king of the north. The papacy gets the Sunday law. And he, pagan Rome, under Pompey, the great papacy, shall stand in the glorious land, Judea, Palestine, which is now the U.S., which by his hand, that's the message to the Levites, that number, shall be consumed. So so we have a lot of messy things here. And, and I knew we did when we were going through this. So when we were going through this and writing this in, we didn't have this straight in our minds exactly how to understand the historical application. Uh, but neither did we have the understanding to definitely, if we didn't understand the historical, to place the application in our time. So this is what we want to try to do is clean this up, get this correct. And so we know that, that Greece up to verse 13, that that's, that, that that's going to be Greece, the history of Greece. But the history of Greece now is going to overlap with the history of Rome. That's how we understand this. So any comments, any thoughts on this first? Okay. On Daniel eleven fifteen, when we're looking at this, that the king of the north shall come and cast up a mount. I remember us going back over this portion of it. Mm -hmm. So the king of the north shall come, cast up a mount, and take the most fenced cities, but the alternate Hebrew is the city of munitions. Yeah, which is the same thing. Okay, but why would why were we addressing the city of munitions being the apostate Protestant churches? Well, because of the parallel to because um, that's going to be Sidon, right? It's Aren't in they, yeah. Aren't they prime? Aren't, aren't they pretty much in lockstep already with the King of the North as far as the subject of Sunday sacredness? Yeah. So, is this a a feminine representation of the Protestant churches, or is this a masculine representation as a government? Okay. So, so your question has to do with the Hebrew. Yeah. So we have to remember in Hebrew, just because something is masculine or feminine doesn't really necessarily mean anything because some words are by nature masculine and some words are by nature feminine. OK. Now, you want to know in verse 15 what's masculine and what's feminine. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this about the fenced cities. Okay. Are, we dealing, are we dealing with a. A religious 
aspect or are we dealing with a government aspect here? Okay, so when you're going to take, um, so I'm just looking at each of these words here. So shall come the king of the north. So take, so the word city is feminine. I'm going to look at this. I have to look at these at the same time. I understand. I mean, so, when I look at the Hebrew, it, it doesn't really translate very clearly as, as the King King James. It's, um, so I'm finding that kind of odd. So I'll go through these word by word. So okay. you're going to see here, so they're going to have 4428. This is Daniel 11, verse 15. Right. So they're going to have the first word they're going to have is shall come. So instead of saying, so the king and north shall come, they're going to start, and shall come, right? Melech, the king. And, and they're going to use this word, Asaphon, which can be translated as north. It, it actually means treasure. But in this context, we know it's the king of the north. And so shall come the king of the north. And then, and shall cast up. Uh, that word there is um, 8210 means uh, to pour out or to spill, right? So um, when you're looking at this word, to spill forth, that is blood, libation, liquid metal, right, etc. cetera. Um, so it does come to mean cast cast up. And, that, and that's just because we're taking basically the Hebrew idiom and sort of making it make sense in in English, right? Now, now then it says, uh, this military mound, right? Solala. So they're gonna pour out a military mound. Now, as far as the, you know, the masculine and feminine and so forth, like this is a masculine sing singular that they're gonna pour out. Uh, and then is so, so is, of course, uh, the mound. The mound is gonna be feminine and singular. And then it says, uh, the lakat. They're going to seize, seize or capture. And that's going to be masculine singular. It's going to be the call perfect tense. So they're going to seize. And then they have this word or, which is, uh, means lots of different things. So this is going to be a feminine singular as well. And, and that word is the word city. So it's the word city. So it's going to be feminine singular. Mm -hmm. And then this fortification, right? That's what it means. It just means like a fortification. Um, the word, so they're going to take 3920, the most fenced. Now, uh, the question is, why do they call it the most fenced cities, right? It's just because most isn't, isn't really there any in uh, Hebrew as a single word, but it's just a masculine plural, right? And it just means fortresses. So so the city itself is a feminine singular, but uh, the word fortress, and the idea here is that this city is also, like this is a, a defensive city. It's a, you know, so that's, that's the idea. It's like a fortress, right? You can say the city of munitions. It doesn't really come across from the Hebrew to put munitions in there because it's more about a fortress. And then what you're going to have after that is after the most fenced cities, uh, the arms of the south shall not withstand. So you're going to have uh, feminine plural, the arms, the south, and the Negev, and not, uh, and that word uh, withstand is that word that's translated as stand. And then, and then it says, and the nation which is technically um, masculine singular, the choicest of that nation. Um, how's that doing that? So that's kind of odd. I guess they're just doing it as, as nothing, nothing of them uh, to stand. So the choicest of thy nation, which I'm saying is the elite, um, the choicest of the nation, they, they have nothing to stand, right? So that's, that's how you would translate it. So as far as, Trying to say is this masculine or feminine? You know, a city is a feminine word, and a fortress is a masculine word. Masculine word. It's, it's always going to be masculine, 
because of the nature of what a fortress is. So some things are always masculine. Some things are always feminine. Well, the reason the reason I brought this up and the reason I'm questioning this, when I was going through this study initially, several years back, mm-hmm. I run into this on the mount, Hebrew 5550. Yeah. Now, this isn't the normal word for mount, because this is really a mound. Right. right? Because mount is har, right? That's a Hebrew word, which means mountain or hill. This is just a mount. That's something that's been piled up. Solila. Yeah, solila. Now, the question that I have here, because this, again, in the sentence construction, was it seemed very odd that this would be an active participle in the feminine sense, but was used passively. The number stuck out to me because of the repeat of the 555. Okay, yeah. Now, there we've, we've always looked at this as being the five wise or the five foolish virgins. Mm-hmm. And, and there's a triple of it. Correct. Which, which does what? Just kind of a complete thing. Well, when, when I'm looking at a triple, I'm thinking of the third angel's message. Now, is there something else I should look at? Um, well, just triple doesn't always mean the third angel's message. Triples can refer to, um, like the completion of something. Okay. Right? Because there are different words for something being complete. Three, is a type of complete. It's a unity, a whole. Seven is a completion of perfection. Ten is also a completion, and so is twelve. Right? So all of them represent some ten representing the world and twelve representing the church. Right? So all of them represent completeness. And if you take three times seven times ten times twelve, three times seven times, you get 2520, right? Right. So, so that's why it's a complete judgment. It takes all of these numbers of completion, multiplies them, and that's God's complete perfect chastisement. So how does that help us with what we're trying to do to interpret this in your mind? What, what is this um, helping us see then? My, my ultimate, my ultimate question in this is that because we're looking at this as being the, for lack of a better way of saying it, the image on the plane of Dura, could this be the construction of a, a religious symbol in this casting up of a mount that is leading to the persecution that will come through fruition under the the ultimate Sunday long. So you would say this is the image of the beast. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, definitely that's, that's how we would apply it. I mean, uh, because the image of the beast has to do with setting up a system of persecution, right? Because that's what the image of the beast is about. When they make an image of the beast, my understanding of it is that we see the beast and what it does. It persecutes God's people. And when they create the image, that image is going to persecute, right? That's what it's going to do. It's going to bring in the mark of the beast and and all the stuff that goes along with it. But, you know, first that image has to be set up. You have to have that system set up in order for uh, that mark of the beast test to happen. Okay. Well, well, let's go back to verse 14 because we, we need to sort out this verse. Okay. Now we know we have this um, this chronological reference that we get from these two numbers. So these two numbers are going to, and I'm just going to put the foot footnote in here for this. So you can see we have some of these numbers already put in there, but we're going to take the one nine two, and we'll do it this way. We'll go the six two five six plus um, 1992, 
and we're going to get from September 11th to April, uh, it was April um, 10th, 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 sorry. 2024, right? Right. That bring us to April 10th, 2024. Uh, it also, the 6256 goes to October um, 28, 2010, or 2018, pardon me, 2018, which is the summary, uh, Jeff, right? So Jeff's summary, I could have probably done it that way. So it's Jeff's summary of the 391.5 and the connection to November 9th, 2019. Okay. So that, that's what happens there. So we have this April 10th. Now we also have, of course, the April 8th and stuff. And I can, I, I'm going to do a drawing and put it in here relating to that. Um, so anyway, so when we look at verse 14 then, uh, and we look at the, at this, it's going to tie us to our history, to this civil war that's occurring in our history, right? And and so then we have to we have to relate these these events to how do they apply to our history? That's what we've done. Now we got that seven two two seven. Um, I had a reference there at the bottom um, to the seven two two seven. And, and adding it to the 192 and the 6256, giving me this number that if I subtracted uh, uh, 14757, which was this period that brought us to October or April 5th, 2030. Anyway, if I take that, I get 718 as, as a difference. But we also have other things attached to this. So the one is if we go back from April 5th, 2030, uh, it brings us to June 22nd, 2010. So it brings us to that symbol. Now, the other thing that we noticed when we were looking at 622 is that if you take 1533 and you subtract 622, you get 911. So I need to somehow bring that all, how those things uh, fit together. But anyway, so, so since it's bringing us to our history, now, if we're looking at the fifth Syri Syrian war, is this the civil war that we're presently in? Is that how we're taking the fifth Syrian war? Now, all of this kind of re represents the civil war, but we would have to say the civil war in 2024. I don't know why it's on. Is there a civil war in 2024 in connection with what's happening in the United States in 2024. Is that what we're looking at? I would think so. Okay. Now, the fact that we have a movie that the Obamas are behind that's being released on April 26, 2024, at least that's their intended date to release it. Sometimes those things change. But we can see the symbol there for uh, July 18th. It And... You know, so that is connected with this history. So we're saying there's a civil war in 2024. Now, exactly what that civil war looks like, um, you know, I don't know. I don't know how much difference it's going to be this, from the civil war that we have presently. But since those point us to, you know, April 10th, 2024, and that's going to be the first day of the first month. And what what I would say is uh, maybe the civil war rather than in 2024, but from uh, the first day of the first month in 2024 to the first day of the first month in 2030, right? So there's going to be a six-year period, not saying that we're saying that that's when the civil war ends, but symbolically it exists in that history, right? We're, we're saying that, there's a civil war that's going to begin in 2024. Uh, maybe this is time setting, but that's what we have as symbols, right? And then we have the first day of the first month in 2030. That's connected to that. So we have these 9-11 uh, and 
June 22nd and April 5th, 2030. They're all connected with these Hebrew numbers in various ways. So, so this fifth civil, fifth Syrian war, I mean, it is a civil war. Now, Philip V, King of Macedon and Antiochus III, I mean, they can't represent the USA. Right? Right. So they must represent the Republican Party in the U.S. So we're going to say Biden or, or slash Democrats. So any thoughts on any of this? Stephen, do you have any thoughts? Now, I put make war propaganda, so I'm looking at this still as an information war, at least at this point. So if we're taking this as a um, parallel, yeah, what, Stephen? I've nothing really to add moment. Okay. Okay, so if we have in this situation that the robbers of thy people, that the papacy is going to exalt themselves to establish the vision. Now, we had made an application of this, Jeff had, to what happened before 1989. So that would have been our primary application of this history. Rome exalts itself to establish the vision. So we can definitely place it there. So the thing about this verse is it's overlapping the end of Greece and the beginning of Rome. So Rome has two interpretations here in this verse. It's going to be the popus, the papacy connecting with Reagan in the 1980s. But that's going to be typical of what's going to happen presently. Does that make sense to people? That may be logical. And, and so when we say, and in those times, I mean, you know, we're, we're going back to, we're taking this whole history, what's happening in this time, because Rome is exalting itself. It's, it's now going to be a new line. But in the old line, if you're finishing Greece, this is the application we're making of Rome. So we almost need two present truth applications. That is, we need to copy Daniel 11, verse 14, and make an application of itself and, and these verses that, that start with the rise of Rome, starting in 1980 80 to 89, exalting itself to establish the vision, and then use Rome to go over that history again. But here, when we're putting in the Civil War and the Republicanism in the USA and the propaganda and Biden and the Democrats, it's obviously not 1980s. But that history... At the end of Greece, with the, when papacy comes in, exalts itself to establish the vision, is typifying what's happening what's, or what's going to happen with the papacy here in this situation. So if we're going to take this history and we're going to make this application, it would tell us that the left is going down, right? Right. Correct. But, but the papacy has to stop it but from being destroyed, right? Because the papacy needs the Democrats. It needs the left. Does that make sense to people? Most definitely. Okay. So so whatever happens in the United States in this next election, I don't know what's going to happen. But if it is uh, a removal of the Democrats in this process, we would see that the papacy has to come in because the papacy... The papacy right now is, 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 is very bizarre, acting extremely odd from how it's acted before. Because the papacy was always this very conservative organization, right? I mean, definitely not accepting homosexuality and transgenderism and all these, these modern uh, leftist ideologies. Though underneath it, the papacy is leftist, especially economically. But now you have a pope who is really in favor of all this wokeism. We have a woke pope, right? We agree with that. I'm not going to disagree with it. Now, he has to, of course, act prudently in the fact that, you know, not all of the church is woke. But Catholics are becoming more and more woke all the time. Right? You still have conservatives within the Catholic church, but you have many Catholics 
who, you know, they've been following the world for so long and they go along with the world, having a pope that's supportive of what's going on in the world, um, you know, is attractive to them, right? So they're going to they're gonna just go along with it. Okay, so we're saying that, that the papacy needs to exalt itself to establish the vision in this context. So that's what we're going to have to look at as we, we go through this study. So I, I got to figure out how to do this. But you can see we're marking the end of these periods. We're, we're coming up to the Sunday law all the way to verse 16. But then we also are going to take these verses and start them at 1989. So so we got a lot of work cut out for us. But I think this makes the most sense. And and what we were having problems with here before was not really understanding this transition. So you're moving from Greece to Rome. So it's the end of Greece and Rome comes in and, and plays a part because Greece is paralleling our history up to the Sunday law. So it plays a part in the Sunday law. But then it's the beginning of Rome. So the same History has to parallel uh, the beginning of our lines, not the end of our lines. And we, we can see how that, that would work. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Just that there's a lot to consider right now. Yeah, there's a lot to consider. Definitely a lot going on. And, um, you know, and God's been really uh, teaching us a lot about righteousness by faith. You know, I'm, I'm very happy with the studies that we had uh, Friday night and on Sabbath, because, you know, these issues, you know, of, of what's going to happen in the future, it, they don't really mean much if we're not converted. Right. If we're not going to be prepared. And so, you know, just studying these things on, on their own without that larger goal in mind of, of character development isn't really going to help us too much. So but I do think that we need to understand these things. Okay, well, let's close with prayer. A dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful, Lord, for all the things that you do in our lives and for the study here this morning. We just ask that you can be with us throughout this week as we study these things on our own and as we study together. We leave all things in your hand, and we ask that your angels can watch over us and our loved ones and that we can be a witness to those around us. Be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.